It really is good to be back home at Woodside, had a little bit of a holiday, and then a couple weeks ago was in Muskrat Dam, and next week uh, we'll be hearing a report uh, from Rick and Linda Martin, who will be here, and another missionary couple, so looking forward to that, and our possible partnership up uh, in the far north, and then last week was speaking at Citizens, our church plant uh, here in Elmira, and it's always just good uh, to be back home here at Woodside. And... Uh, the scripture reading that Julia Rug just read from Psalm 24, if you're not already there, I invite you, if you have a Bible or device, to turn to this psalm, and we'll get there in just a moment. I was traveling not too long ago with some staff, and as we were driving in the car, uh, there's a playlist playing, and uh, there's three young staff kind of around me, and they're listening to this playlist, and, and uh, one of them says, hey, we should listen, now they were listening to Christian music, but we should listen to some old Christian music, like the classic, the old Christian music. Now, when that was suggested, I didn't think they're going to have a playlist with uh, George Beverly Shea uh, bellowing out, you know, just as I am in the great hymns of the faith. No. But I at least thought they were going to go and put on some Keith Green 50 years ago, my generation, yeah. No. We'll play some Newsboys. <laughs> newsboys? Late 90s, early 2000s is old Christian music? You guys are getting older, I just gotta say that. That's old Christian music. Well, as we continue in this four week series in the Psalms, we're, going, uh, we're looking at uh, the oldest playlist, the classic playlist of the people of God. And this playlist was not only sung thousands of years ago, but it's to be sung today by you and me. As you journey through life, you want to learn to go to the Psalms, to these prayers, and in a sense, sing them to God. So uh, when you are just kind of disillusioned with your future, what's happening in my life, where am I going, you would go to Song 23, the, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm okay, he's going to lead me and guide me. Uh, when you start to envy people or you see injustice and people that are doing bad things and getting away with it and saying hurtful things and you're like, is it worth it for me to be a Christian? They seem to have it so good and, and I don't. And so you turn to song 73 and you go into the sanctuary of God and you realize their end and you're like, wait a second, big picture, it's not good. I'm actually the one it's okay, but as for me, I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge. Uh, when something comes upon you suddenly, and there's just a, a shock or something, you turn to Psalm 121. I look to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And sometimes when we go to these songs, we have to put them on repeat. And in the soundtrack of our minds, We've got to sing them again and again. Psalm 139, if you're feeling worthless or of no value or seems like nobody sees you. Oh, the Lord was the one that knit me together in my mother's womb. Oh, the Lord is the one that made me fearfully and wonderfully. Oh, it's the Lord that even though I'm not perfect, still sees me and loves me and thinks about me. How precious to me are your thoughts, oh God. So I want to encourage you as you journey through life to get into the Psalms and, and find one that speaks to you and then, in a sense, sing it back to God. Well, today, we're going to look at Psalm 24, the psalm that was just read. And this psalm is about the King of Glory. It's about God and his intersection with humanity, with you and with me. And as David is going to sing, he realizes that this God of glory intersects and dwells with his people. Now, before we get into the text, I want to just back up and remind us, what does glory mean? When you read your Bible in the Old Testament, the, use, the word glory is used over and over again in the New Testament as well. But the Hebrew word means, kvod, means heavy. It means of worth. It means of beauty. So whenever you see king of glory or you read that, you're thinking of heaviness, that this God, this king, is heavy. Uh, Kavod also, it, it has the idea of this glory coming from his intrinsic being. 
So his glory is manifested, it's expressed, it's an outshining of who he is. So when we see the glory of God, we're seeing who God really is. And so when we see it, then we're to respond to it. When you, as you journey through life, get a glimpse of this God's glory, his weight and beauty, you're going to live for it. If you're living for your glory, you need to get a glimpse of the glory of God. But not only as you journey through life are you living for his glory, but you're enjoying his glory. You're celebrating, what a God I have. I'm in relationship with this God, and you enjoy it. Even if you're going through the the worst of times, there's still a song in your soul. This glory of God that he's given to us and shown us is a gift to you and to me. Uh, About a month and a half ago, uh, my wife and I celebrated our 29th anniversary. Can I share with you what her main, what I got for her main gift? I wrote 150 songs about me. (laughs) And I had them bound in a book. Songs about how great I am and how good I am. And I took this and I gave it to my wife. I said, honey, this is for you. So as you journey through life, you can sing these back to me and just tell me how great I am. And how wonderful I am. Okay, it didn't happen. But God gives you the gift of revealing his glory to you. He gives you these 150 songs talking about his greatness and goodness so that you can enjoy him. The one who wired you, wired, and because he has this intrinsic glory, the one who wired you, wired you in such a way that when you respond to who he is, it's good for you. So I want to encourage you to learn to sing his glory. And uh, again, today, if you're here and you're uh, unhappy, you're selfish, you're uh, jealous, you're anxious, um, whatever it is you're struggling with, yes, there's, as we open scripture, there's three steps you can take here and two steps you can take there. Those are fine and good, but what you need more than anything is to see his glory because when you see his glory as paul says in second corinthians 3 it changes you that what we behold we become and when we see this king of glory it changes how i see things and respond in life so today i've broken this uh, psalm up into three verses if you will and that as, as we journey through life we can sing the first verse second verse and the third verse so psalm 24 let's look at verses one and two First, David says, he talks about singing God's greatness. That's verse one, singing God's greatness. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. So this psalm is about the intersection of God, his abode is heaven, and man, our abode is earth, and it's about the intersection. But notice He talks about the Lord, but he doesn't start talking about heaven. He starts talking about earth. Now, why does he tell us that the king of glory, this earth in which we live as human beings, it belongs to him? Not just everything in it, but everyone in it. It all belongs to him because he founded it. He established it. He created it. Why does David go there? Because he wants us and he wants to remind us that God hasn't invaded our space. It's his space. It belongs to him. So when we say here on earth, we don't want God in our classrooms. We don't want God in our politics. We don't want God in this, that, and the other thing. And there is merit, some merit, to that argument because there's people misrepresenting the true God and using it for their own ends. But the true living God He's to be welcome here because this is his space. He created it all. He belong, it belongs to him. So just a reminder to you today, if you have a house, you don't own your house. You're just stewarding it. If you have a car, it doesn't belong to you. 
It ultimately belongs to God. If you have a cottage, it's not yours. If you have a tent, anybody got a one-person tent? Even your one-person tent doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. When you understand that reality, it frees you from being discontent. You realize, oh, God, everything is his. He gave this to me. Thank you for this. What I don't have, I'm okay. You've got it. It belongs to him. You'll find in Scripture, too, that God is not just our creator, but because he's our creator, he's our sovereign ruler. He rules over creation. But please understand this. Because it's his space, it's his rightful rule over creation. If you're a new Christian, one of the doctrines you want to learn is the sovereignty of God, that God rules over everything in the universe, but everything in your life, macro level, micro level. And when you understand that and bad things happen and things aren't going your way, you can still, as you behold him, experience peace and comfort and strength and confidence because you know the one who not only created you in all things, but it all belongs to him, he rules over it. So, David starts with God, with telling us that this space belongs to God. I want to pause just for a moment and go to another song that David wrote, that he sang, Psalm 19, where we read, uh, this, the uh, heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. In other words, God not only owns the space and creation, but creation tells us about the God who owns it. In fact, day after day, night after night, all that we look around and see, the creation just won't shut up about this God. You, you just can't shut him up. It's, it, day after day it keeps telling us about this God. Well, what does it tell us about this God? Well, if you've recently been watching or, or uh, following what they're discovering in space today in science, we're discovering just how massive the universe is. And we're discovering the um, details in our creation. It's just unbelievable. What does that tell us about God? That he is intelligent and wise and powerful. As we see new images of animals and vegetation, everything, what does that tell us about God? That he is creative and artistic and beautiful. That all of creation is saying, there's a God of glory. And you're getting a little glimpse of who he is, all these attributes, all these perfections, all these characteristics. So when you see this universe and how big it is, he is powerful. But it's not simply, oh, God's powerful. That's great. It's God is infinitely powerful. He's infinitely wise. He's infinitely good. He's infinitely, there's no end to that. So if I was to say to you today, who's the most powerful person in the Woodside Church family? Do you want to email me and, and tell me? Okay. Let's say we use the measurement of how much you can be bench press. Anybody here 300 pounds? Guy or girl? 300? Okay. If you can bench 300, Enjoy it, because it will be long, won't be long before you won't be benching 300, okay? <laughs> Ooh, 300 pounds. That's quite impressive. God's creation, it wasn't like he struggled. I gotta, his power is infinite. This God of glory has created, and it all belongs to him, and it all speaks of his glory. David sings that glory, the greatness of God. He doesn't look through a microscope. He doesn't look through a telescope but he sings it. If you look at history, when we started looking through a microscope and a telescope, you will find scientists who, on their playlist, are praising this God of glory. Some of the most famous scientists in the past, Newton, some say at the top, Newton, Pascal, Kepler, they all believed in a personal creator God. And not just since David and, and the Pascals, but also today, there are world-renowned scientists at our top universities, so Harvard, MIT, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge. There are scientists 
on their playlist, they're praising a personal God. They believe in a God who created all things. And in fact, as we advance in science and we continue to learn, again, it's not pointing us away from a creator, it's pointing us to a creator. Science is increasingly making the case for God. I want to ask you, on your playlist, do you go around praising God, the personal creator? We, or you, us, we find many people that are playing a different playlist. And one of the most common ones today in our modern world is the atheist playlist. We're not praising God because there is no God. Science has disproved God. Let me tell you, share with you a couple of verses on this playlist. First verse, and they're not singing this anymore. First word, verse is, there's no God. We don't need a God because the universe is eternal. It's just always being. When I was in high school, when I was in university, that's the song I heard. It's always eternal. Problem is, as science has advanced, we now know that creation is not eternal. It came into being at a moment in time. Interesting. That's consistent with Scripture. Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It came into being at a moment in time. Now, you can call it the Big Bang. You can call it whatever you want. But our universe had a beginning. It's not eternal. And this God, he spoke it into existence. He created what we call ex nihilo, out of nothing. Be reminded today that everything in our universe, everything emerged from nothing into something. Everything emerged from nothing into something. And it's hard for us to get our minds around the concept of nothingness. So at one time, everybody want to kind of, okay, everybody with me here? No space, no time, no matter, no energy, no like nothing. And no laws of physics, no evolutionary processes. Yes, God's the God of all truth, and we see things evolve, and that's a whole micro, we believe in microevolution, that things evolve within their species. But we're saying evolu the universe is not eternal. It had a moment in time. There was nothing. So with that playlist, that first verse is not being sung anymore. Second verse that's often sung on the atheist playlist is that, well, it was always just there, which it wasn't, and everything in it, it just happened. Just given enough time, things just appeared and emerged the way we see them today. Problem is, as we continue to advance in science, we're seeing more and more what's called the fine-tuning argument. It, it's, it's getting so incredibly clear that there's design in everything that's been made. With the universe, coming into being, do you know the odds of the universe coming into being? Okay, it's not one in a million, one in a billion, one in a trillion. It's the one with a lot of zeros behind it. Oh, the universe just happened. And the four fundamental forces that hold the universe together, gravity, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, the odds of just one of them coming into being and being precisely um, created so that the universe exists, is th those numbers are crazy. We're talking like one with 120 zeros behind it, one with 156 zeros behind it. So in other words, gravity, if gravity was just like the smallest little bit weaker, the universe wouldn't be. If it was just a little bit stronger, the universe wouldn't be. These numbers are, we can't comprehend them. Uh, then we look at the Earth. The Earth, in the middle of nowhere, it coming into being, what are the odds of that? Not only that, what are the odds of it being in a solar system and a place where there's life can happen? 
on this rock. What are the odds of that? And then, oh, we have the sun, right distance, right heat, all the things about the sun. That just happened too? Then we have the moon. If we didn't have the moon, we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't live. If we have one of, there's many moons, but it, we have one moon that's the right size, right distance from the earth. Again, that, that happening by chance, number's way too big. And then you got Jupiter and Saturn. I want, uh, here's a prize for anybody this morning, today. If you got up today and you said, God, I just, as I start this day, I want to just praise you for creating Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, if, if that was your, if you said that today, there's a prize for you after the church service. I will give you some money to go eat somewhere. If J J uh, Jupiter and Saturn, two of these planets around us, they're running interference for us as we fly 67,000 miles through space. They have strong gravity, which prevents meteorites and asteroids from hitting us. Oh, that just happened by chance. They just happened to be there. Okay. Water. We need water to live. Oh, we have water. And the complexity of water, unbelievable. Then we start talking about human life. How did something, how did non-life produce life? Again, this playlist from the atheists from 70 years ago, there, there's no verse for this. What's the verse from non-life to life? Apart from uh, the the brains that we have and the eyes that we have with two million working parts and all the like design, scientists today are discovering that cellular life is far more complex than we ever thought. In other words, as we continue to get better and better tools, we realize there is a design behind all of this. These numbers are so outrageous, ridiculous, preposterous that John Lennox, the former mathematician at Oxford, and a philosopher of science said, atheism is incompatible with science. And people in the, with playing the atheist playlist, some of the militant ones today, at the top, I won't go to the names, but do you know what they're saying as they're seeing more and more design? They are saying, okay, there's design, but it's not divine design. There's extra, extraterrestrials or aliens that may be the cause of what we see. Oh, okay. What's the evidence for that? And where they come from, who are they? No, it's all pointing. Creation tells us, are you, as you journey through life, are you playing the playlist? You recognize, oh God, thank you for that sunset. Look at that bright sunset. That's beautiful. You're an artistic God. And then you see the moon at night and you're like, Oh, well, it's not howling, but I know it's there for a reason. Praise you for the moon. Water. Anybody going swimming sometime soon in this heat? Lord, thank you for this water. I, I don't understand everything about it, but woo, it's something. Or snow. Anybody just like snow? Okay, come forward. We're going to pray for you, and then we'll move on. <laughs> but the snow, no two snowflakes. What? They're not the same. Okay. He is worthy of your praise. And again, when you give him glory, you sing his greatness, it's good for you. It's good for you. If you're not already praising him, learn to praise him for his greatness. Second verse. Oh, and by the way, I just want to say to our young people, okay, for you in science, get beyond the sound bites, okay? Science and faith, they don't go together. They're mutually exclusive. Really? Okay, let's go beneath the surface and look at the facts, okay? Again, there's scientists at the top who believe in this personal creator God. Second verse, we praise him for his greatness, we praise him for his goodness. David draws our attention in this song to God as the God of salvation and the God of every blessing. Verses three and four. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. So David talks about our abode, earth, it belongs to the Lord. And in a sense, it tells us about our great uh, Lord. But now he's going to talk about heaven. And when you read in scripture about heaven, sometimes it's referred to as a high mountain or a holy mountain. So here David is saying, who can come into the presence of this king of glory, this God? Who can come into his space? And David tells us, the person, man or woman, who is righteous, 
Look what he says. He says, the one who has a pure heart and does not trust in an idol. In other words, this person that's righteous has a pure heart, not impure in any way, never an impure thought, never an impure action, never impure word, nothing impure, and never trusting in anything this God has not created. This, this one is right with God and right with people. The one who has clean hands, never ever took advantage of someone, never just and righteous, and this one has never lied, doesn't swear by a false God, that that person, their abode on earth, can come into the abode of God in heaven. The righteous person. Is David teaching us that we just need to buckle down and, you know, I'm going to do my best to do what God wants me to do, and I'm going to try to do my best with people so that God will like me and let me in? Well, Paul tells us elsewhere in Romans 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. And for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, as we look around our planet today and in the past, there's not one single person that can stand in the presence of a holy, righteous God. No, not one. We've all fallen short. We've all, what we call, we've all sinned. So as David's saying, I'm teaching you something different. You can earn your way into God's presence. No, David knew what Paul knew, that the God that we have is not only great, but he is good. He's a God who forgives, a God who is merciful, a God who is gracious. Look what he says in verses four and five. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. David knows there's a God who gives, and we can receive from him our salvation, our vindication, and we can receive blessings. In fact, every blessing comes from him. So David knows that we can't stand in the presence of a righteous God, but David knows that God has promised to do something to make us righteous so that we could be with him forever, so that we could dwell with God. So David, 3,000 years ago, knows there's a Messiah, a deliverer coming, and sure enough, David didn't know the exact date, but sure enough, in human history, 1,000 years after David, Someone died on a Roman cross called Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And it was there on the cross that God took our sin, put it on him, and we get an, we were, there was an exchange that took place. He took your bad stuff and gave you his good stuff, his righteousness, so that when God the Father sees you, if you've trusted Jesus to save you from your sins, if you're saved, if you're a Christian, he sees you, as righteous. David was looking ahead to what God would do for us. We look back to what God has done for us. And in the cross, we see the glory of God. We see his goodness. Because the reality is, none of us can waltz into the presence of a holy, righteous God. That's the story we find in Scripture. That's why there was the tabernacle Sacrifices had to be made. The temple, sacrifices had to be made. And then the cross, the ultimate sacrifice, was made. But note this. We don't just simply get to meet this God. Say, oh, you've forgiven my sins. There's something else. When I was up at Muskrat Dam uh, with a couple others from church, and next week we'll give some introductions, but... Up at Muskrat Dam, um, we met about five, I think it was about five different chiefs. And one of the chiefs we met, uh, he was a past chief, and he'd been to Ottawa and involved in public policy and all of that. But when Rick Martin, uh, the missionary from Woodside here, introduced me and, uh, and Willard Bauman to him at the time, uh, he said, and oh, he's met the queen. This chief has met the queen of England. How'd you like that life, going through life with that label? Yeah, I work at such and such. Yeah, I got yeah, this in my life. And oh, I met the queen. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's something far greater than that. Well, you met the queen. Here's the thing with the queen. 
You just don't waltz into her presence. How many of you, earlier in June, when uh, England celebrated the platinum jubilee of Queen Elizabeth, said, you know what? I think I'm going to hop on a plane. You hopped on a plane. You landed at Heathrow. You took an Uber to Buckingham Palace. Talked to the guards there. Said, yeah, I, I want to hang out with the queen. Met the queen. Yeah, I'd like to have tea with you. I hear you like tea. I don't, but here you do. None of us. Why? Because we don't go into the presence of a monarch, a queen, without being invited there by her invitation. And when you understand that that there's someone far greater than the queen, someone who cannot sin, who rules forever, that that God says to you and to me, not only do I want to meet you, but I want you to live with me and be with me forever. And when you understand the cross has made a way for you to be righteous, I'm going to be with with Jesus in heaven because I'm a righteous person because I belong to Jesus. And when I behold him, not just his greatness, his goodness, more and more I want to live for him. When I stop behold him and I start to listen to other things and see other things, no, I've got to behold him. Parents, can I encourage you with your children, to pray this prayer for them, and maybe you have adult children they, that aren't following the Lord. Would you pray this prayer? There's three prayers that I've kind of prayed uh, as my kids uh, grew up, and I still pray them to this day. These are three prayers outside of, you know, Lord, please keep them safe, and Lord, please help them to do well in the test, and, and all of that. There was one prayer, and it's, Lord, I pray for my three kids that they will love you with their whole being and follow you all the days of their life, that they would love you with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray that, Lord, that they love you with their whole being. And then a second prayer I pray is, Lord, I pray that they will be a blessing to other people. I actually prayed that when my wife was pregnant for each, all three of them. Will they, will they be a blessing that they love their neighbor as their self? But the prayer that's bigger than those prayers that I pray today is, Lord, help them to see your glory. Because when they see who you are and what you're like, that changes everything. When I'm selfish, when I'm upset, when things aren't going my way, when I'm, you know, uh, poor me, all of those things, yeah, we struggle with those things, but when I get a glimpse of the one that I'm in relationship with, that changes everything. So, uh, parents, if you're praying for your kids to be good, take it up a few notches, okay? If they behold the king of glory, they'll be good, okay? Pray that prayer. Problem is that we have among Christian kids starting to behold, and I praise God for our church, so I, man, God is doing a great work in our children and youth, but, but across the Christian, Christianity of the spectrum, you've got young people who instead of beholding Jesus and getting into the Bible and going to church on a regular basis to learn more about him and behold him, They've turned to behold the things of of this created world. So uh, recently, Instagram, there was a study on Instagram, and this is one of the things they found in particularly teen girls. So any teen girls here? Okay, right? This is a study that they found that teen girls that were on Instagram beholding those images, that they became anxious, lonely, and sad. And not just a little bit, severely anxious, lonely, and sad. That as a young girl, I'm looking at that girl who I know or this girl I don't know, and I'm like, why do they get to go there? Why are they going out with so-and-so? It's called, young people, help me here, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out, okay? They're just like FOMO, fear of missing out. And they found in this study that many of them became jealous. How come they get to do that. Well, look at me. Nobody cares about me. And just a little footnote about Instagram, okay? I'm not in, on Instagram, but if you are, it's okay to post what you had for dinner, okay? You want people to know that's great. Keep doing it. But just be careful, because the trap is when we post, you know, here's me on my trip, and here's 25 things on my trip, and here's how great, oh, please, i got to get the right picture so everybody knows. At the root of that, is a desire to be loved, is a desire to be seen, is a desire to be known. 
like, here I am, everybody look at me, C come on, I, I matter. Problem is, if I'm beholding, and that's where I'm trying to be seen and loved, not good, anxious, lonely, sad. If instead, our kids and our youth and, and young girls, if we behold Jesus and we understand, I am known, I am seen, I am loved by God, the God who made me, that frees that person from trying and striving to get everybody to like them. I can just be me and be who God created me to be. And oh God, thank you. And I'm praising you daily for your goodness. By the way, worship and dragging your kids to, to church to worship. When they see the glory of God, you won't have to drag them. It's a byproduct of seeing his glory. I want to go and worship this God who loved me and died on the cross for me. And again, if your kids aren't there, if they're not doing that, would you begin to pray? Lord, help them to see your glory. So on our playlist, we sing his greatness. We sing his goodness. Oh God, thank you for the sun and the moon and the stars. Oh God, thank you for every good blessing in my life, for ice cream and for air conditioning and for Canada and for all of these things. Third verse, we sing, or you sing, your joyful surrender. Lord, you are worthy of my life. I'm living for you. You're worthy of my surrender. Verse 7, David continues, Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. So what's this about doors and ancient gates? David, who wrote this, was early in his reign. A lot of the Psalms can be con uh, connected to events in the past. If you go to 2 Samuel chapter 6, you can probably, the story is likely from, from this time. But David, when he became king, he came into Jerusalem, he renamed the, the city, he uh, was going to rule, it was among uh, mountains, and what you did back in the ancient world is you built, the king would build a walled city, so protection around the city. So David, in Jerusalem, there's this walled city, and he calls for the Ark of the Covenant. If you go back before David to Moses, Mount Sinai, God says to, to the Israelites, I will be your God and you will be my people. And God was represented by the Ark of the Covenant, which houses or housed two tablets, the Ten Commandments, and there's a couple other things in there, but it represented the presence of God. So David has in mind when he's writing this, lift up, lift, lift up the gates so that the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, could come into Jerusalem. It would be housed in the tabernacle and later the temple. So it could come in, God could rightfully rule among his people. So that's the picture. There's another picture as well. If you read in the Old Testament, the Israelites would go out to battle sometimes with the Ark of the Covenant. And then when they returned from battle with the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, they would come back to Jerusalem and the, there would be this exchange between the priests who were leading the procession and the gatekeepers. And the priests would say, you know, open up the gates. And the gatekeepers say, well, who is it? And so that's what we've got going on here. But notice here, he says, lift up you gates and, and ancient doors. And we know that in that day, the gates and the doors did not lift up. They lifted out. So what is David saying? Well, if you notice, lift up your heads, that's a posture in Scripture of reverence. So it's not only open up the gates for the King of glory to come in, but lift up your head in reverence to him. In a sense, surrender to him. Let him in. Then we see in verse 8, this response. Who is this king of glory? And then the priest would respond. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. This king of glory is a king with power. And if you're here today and all of a sudden it's like, oh, sorry, I'm cynical when it comes to anyone with power, can I pause and just share this? Among human beings, we see a misuse of power in people in positions of power. We see misuse of power in homes. We see it in churches. We see it in government. We see it in organizations where people with power do things for their own advantage. They misuse it. I was on my holidays recently and I read uh, the book Indian in the Cabinet by Jody Wilson-Raybould. 
uh, who was the first indigenous woman to serve as Minister of Justice and our Attorney General. And she talks about in this book of coming from outside of Ottawa into Ottawa. And she's coming with all this hope, you know, and rah, rah, we won't talk about the days. And by the way, I'm not talking about any particular party here, it's just, but just want to share what she had in her book. But she comes in, rah, rah, and, and if you can remember the lingo when she first came in. But she came in there with all of these high hopes. And she says in her book, there are MPs, and by the way, there are MPPs and even municipal elected officials who want to do the right thing. But she says there's others who don't. And she talked about coming into Ottawa and seeing that power and partisanship, being loyal to your party. And she shared this, that coming into power that wasn't the win, the goal. The goal was to stay in power, to do whatever you had to do to make any decision so you could stay in power. She saw power and partisanship trumping or more important than love and truth and justice. And she talks about how she saw people that she once believed in, how power changed them. And that's the world we live in, human beings using their power for their own advantage but not this king, not this king of glory. If you know his story, he has all power and he took that power and came to this world and used it for your advantage. Paul in Philippians 2 recites a song that the early Christians used to sing. And in the song, part of the verse goes like this, talking about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't come and play the God card. Everybody, I'm going to use you, abuse you, you do what I say. But rather, Paul goes on to say in this song, that he became nothing, became one of us, became a servant, and died on a cross for you and for me. He used his power for your good so that this righteous God and you could live forever. When you understand that, it's not, I'm just going to surrender my life to you, but it's a joyful surrender. Man, if God did that for you, he's got your best interests at heart. You can trust in this good God. David ends with this in verses 9 and 10. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of of glory. On your playlist, have you opened up your life to Jesus, the King of glory? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, the invitation is not for you to make Jesus king. He already is king. The invitation is for you to bow to that king. And when you bow and you learn more about him, you find it's the best decision you'll ever make. Are you singing the praise and the glory of God? I want to remind every one of you that if you're a follower of Jesus, you're to live for his glory. As Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 10, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So if you're in a marriage, do your marriage for the glory of God. If you're single, do your singleness for the glory of God. If you're living in a, in a uh, tent and you're on vacation, tent and have fun to the glory of God. And what does that mean? It means as I'm eating and drinking, I'm doing it in such a way that if anybody asks, there's a great God and a good God. Why are you so kind? Why are you so patient? How come you're giving me this gift? How come you and your wife, you always forgive each other? You're living for his glory. But also, you're not just living for his glory. When you behold Jesus, you get to enjoy his glory as you go through life. Well, I want to remind you of your future. If you belong to Jesus, you're united with him. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, you've been raised and seated with him, past tense. I know what I'm doing a few days after tomorrow. I'm going into the presence of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I'm righteous. Because of his righteousness. I get to go through life with that wonderful hope and joy. I get to enjoy his glory. As Paul would say in Colossians 3, to the Christians at Colossae. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Now get this part. 
when Christ appears, you also will appear with him in glory. And when you think that through, that brings joy. I'm going to be with Jesus. Again, John said, I saw a new heaven, new earth. The abode of God, heaven, earth, the abode of man. I saw a new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down, and God himself dwells with man. That one day you will see the face of God in Jesus. And John goes on to tell us in that chapter, Revelation 21, that's a place of glory. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I'm going to invite you to stand for prayer. And in just a moment, we are going to celebrate a baptism a young man who has seen the glory, just gotten a glimpse of the glory of Christ, and we'll celebrate, and we're going to sing a song before that. I want to encourage you as we sing this song about God's greatness and his goodness, he's our creator and the cross, that as we sing that song, you would do so saying today again, Lord, I again today commit to surrender joyfully to you. You're my life. I want to live for you. Help me to enjoy your glory. So let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for each person here and for those watching online. Lord, I'm praying for each one. Lord, that you would help them to see your glory, your greatness, and your goodness. Lord, for the parents, help them to continue to be intentional about getting their kids to behold your glory. Thank you for our children's workers and our youth workers trying to help these young people to see your glory. I pray your blessing upon each one of them. And then, Lord, if there's someone here that has never bowed and surrendered to the King of glory, your son Jesus, I pray that they would. And Lord, help us as a church to continue to share you to this world that desperately needs to see your glory. We pray this in your name. Amen.